Okay, so welcome everyone. We're very happy to have uh, Matthew Colbrook speaking this week. So Matthew did his PhD from Cambridge and finished in 2020, just uh, a couple of years ago. And he's currently at ENS in uh, Paris, where he has a um, fellowship. Um, and I think he's going back to Cambridge from next year, uh, where he'll be a junior research fellow at Trinity College, Cambridge. Um, he's won sort of multiple awards. So for example, the um, ASIAM award um, and IMA, IMA um, award, uh, sort of, uh, several sort of um, scholarships, um, the Smith Knight, Relly Knight Prize, um, the uh, okay, and a couple of other sort of prizes as well. So we're very happy to have um, Matthew talk this week, and he's going to be talking on the subject of um, is it Smale's 18th problem and the barriers of deep learning. I'm not sure yep. how it Okay, so over to you, Matt. Great. Well, thank you for the uh, very kind introduction and the opportunity to speak. So I thought I'd, um, on the title side, tell you what Smell's 18th problem is, so you're not guessing through half the talk. Um, so Smell wrote a list of problems for the 21st century, inspired by uh, Hilbert's uh, famous list for the 20th century. And his 18th problem, uh, so remember this was written around 2000, uh, was what are the limits of artificial uh, intelligence? So we're going to see in a few slides time, but this is a very uh, timely question. Okay, so the results in this talk are based on uh, these two papers here. Uh, one with co-authors uh, Vega Danson at the University of Oslo and uh, Anders Hansen uh, at Cambridge. And then uh, another one just by myself here as well, uh, which you can find on my website. Okay, so I thought I'd start off with a fun uh, slide. So if you look at the number of uh, papers on machine learning submitted to the archive, you can see an exponential uh, growth. Uh, so a fun fact, if during the first lockdown you tried to keep up and read every single one of these papers, you need to read a paper continually, night and day, uh, every four uh, minutes or so. Uh, so of course that's an unrealistic goal, but the point is that there's a huge uh, exponential increase uh, in the interest in uh, deep learning and machine uh, learning in general. Okay. Uh, so a question that you might ask is, for example, will these new techniques uh, replace standard algorithms in medical imaging. So we're going to focus on a particular uh, example of, of Smell's agent problem uh, in this field. So there was a paper a few years out uh, in Nature uh, where they trained a neural network end-to-end uh, -end for MRI reconstruction and then claimed superior immunity to noise and uh, reduction in reconstruction artifacts. So we're actually going to test this claim uh, later on. Um, I'm going to look at important problems such as stability, uh, and accuracy. So keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, so there's very strong confidence uh, surrounding deep learning uh, at the moment. Uh, for example, Jeffrey Hinton, who's one of the, uh, the godfathers of deep learning, announced in 2017 that they should uh, stop training uh, radiologists. Okay, so that's, that's a very bold co uh, confidence statement. And it's, it's true that, you know, deep learning has, has led to uh, amazing uh, steps over the last uh, decade or so in, in numerous uh, areas, but at the same time, uh, in some particularly very uh, safety-driven uh, applications, we also have to be aware of uh, the following, which is uh, AI-generated hallucinations. So uh, th th this is related to instability. So you might have seen things like adversarial examples for image classification, uh, but this is, this is an example for uh, an inverse problem so the vast MRI challenge is a bit like the uh, image net challenge. Okay, so different teams will compete uh, to do uh, MRI reconstruction. So they'll have a, a training uh, set where they'll try and uh, construct these, these neural network methods or, or, or other techniques. And then there'll be an unseen test uh, set on which they're, uh, they're ranked. Uh, and one of the findings of this challenge uh, in 2020 was that the, the winning entries tended to uh, hallucinate in certain cases. Okay, so here you have the ground truth image. So this is uh, a brain. And here you see an added uh, detail that the neural network uh, adds in that looks physically plausible. I mean, I'm not a, a doctor, but you know, it's, uh, it can be pretty difficult to detect some of these, um, these hallucinations. Okay, and this caused quite a stir. So there's there's now a um, what, what the two the uh, the latest version of the fast 
MRI challenge has a, uh, a subcategory that looks at trying to uh, minimize this uh, hallucination effect. So this problem, of course, in, in, in such applications like medical diagnosis is um, of potential concern, uh, but it's also of legal concern. For example, the European Commission uh, rec recently outlined um, that sort of uh, the mantra for, for legal AI uh, with a focus on uh, robustness, security, and uh, accuracy. Okay, so let me give you a quick example of uh, instabilities, which is this other um, problem that I mentioned earlier. So you've probably seen adversarial perturbations for uh, image classification, but you can also get a similar effect for uh, image reconstruction. For example, your uh, machine, uh, machine learning um, algorithm sees a subsampled uh, discrete Fourier transform or an MRI scan, and then it tries to reconstruct uh, the image. So these figures, by the way, are from this uh, paper, uh, also with um, Vega, Anton, and co-authors from a, a couple of years back. Um, so on the left here, what I have is the, uh, the true image, and then I have the reconstruction uh, of the image. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a small um, perturbation to the left-hand side. Okay, and then we're going to look at the output of uh, the neural network. So th this is just a, a neural network from this uh, particular paper. You can get a, a very similar effect for lots of other uh, different neural networks, and you can you can see them in this paper here. Okay, so perturbation on the left, output on the right. So we first look at a small perturbation. Okay, so it's very hard to see the difference on the left hand side, but on the right hand side we see some instability. Okay, so particularly in these regions. Uh, here. Okay, so let's increase the size of the perturbation, see what happens. Okay, and surprisingly, uh, the right hand side becomes uh, even more severe. And then again, um, and if you're a doctor, for example, these types of perturbations can be the most dangerous, right? Because if you see something like this, it's clear that something uh, incorrect or non physical is going on. Uh, oops, but, um, but here, for example, it can be quite hard to de detect these uh, these types of issues. And then finally, just to show you that I'm not uh, I'm not cheating. Here's the uh, reconstruction with the state of the art um, compressed uh, compress sensing method. And you can again you can apply the same adversarial tests to these classical methods, and they seem to be uh, robust. Okay. So um, Smell's 18th problem: the limits of artificial intelligence. This is all related to the question of whether we can get uh, stable and accurate uh, AI systems. Okay, so how, how can we know that what we're actually producing uh, is correct? For example, those, um, those adversarial perturbations or those uh, hallucinations. And this is a question that um, isn't just for uh, grumpy mathematicians. Uh, it's something that um, leaders in the field of machine learning uh, have also realized. So I think this quote from uh, Jan LeCun is, uh, is quite good at explaining this. So he goes to say that uh, very often the creation of a technological artifact precedes the science that goes uh, with it. And then he goes on to give an example. The steam engine was invented before thermodynamics. Thermo thermodynamics was invented to explain uh, the steam engine, essentially the limitations of it. What we're after is the equivalent of thermodynamics for intelligence. So I think we're now at the stage we're figuring out what you can and what you cannot do with these uh, new exciting techniques uh, is of really um, fundamental importance. So IEEE Spectrum, uh, who self-identify as the, uh, the world's leading engineering magazine, uh, run, a, run a story on their uh, 2021 top stories. And they concluded that 2021 was the year uh, in which the wonders of artificial intelligence stopped being a story Many of this year's top articles grappled with the limits of deep learning, uh, which they uh, go on to call today's dominant strand of AI. So I think uh, what we will see over the next few years or so, uh, if, if, if these sort of predictions are correct, as an increase in uh, interest in uh, Smell's 18th problem and uh, related uh, issues. So before I go on and talk about actually um, an example of uh, some mathematical theorems in, in, in this um, related to this problem. I just wanted to draw a parallel with uh, an old uh, story. Okay, so 
At the beginning of uh, the 20th century, Hilbert outlines a, uh, a vision for mathematics, which was to secure its foundations. Uh, and very similar to the optimism that we uh, see at the moment surrounding uh, AI, machine learning, deep learning, um, there was a huge optimism surrounding this uh, program. And there were four central, uh, central areas of this program. First of all, that mathematics should be written in a precise language, okay, uh, which you manipulate according to precise rules. A completeness, a proof that all true mathematical statements uh, can be proven. Consistency, a proof that you can never gain in a contradiction. And decidability, an algorithm for deciding the truth of uh, any given uh, mathematical uh, statement. So for example, Hilbert's 10th problem on that list uh, for the 20th century was to provide an algorithm which for any given polynomial equation with integer coefficients decides whether there is an integer valued solution. So note in particular how Hilbert has phrased uh, this problem, provide an algorithm. Okay, so there's a strong confidence uh, that such an algorithm exists uh, somewhere. Okay, um, now of course Hilbert uh, was no fool and realized that um, all of these things uh, needed proofs, which is why he uh, outlined this program. Okay, so why am I telling you all this? Well, um, along then came Gödel and Turing and turn, uh, turned um, Hilbert's um, optimism upside down. Okay, so um, they, were, they produced foundational results. For example, Gödel showed that there are true statements in mathematics that can never be uh, proven. And Turing, uh, that there are computational problems that cannot be solved uh, with an algorithm. And rather than sort of stopping mathematics in its tracks, what these foundational results uh, led to, uh, and, and you can see this uh, more generally for, for other uh, areas of maths as well, is a better understanding, okay? You can figure out which, which are the feasible directions for new techniques. Uh, and often it also leads to uh, new methods or new ways uh, of looking at things. Um, so just to finish the sort of historical story, Hilbert's 10th problem, uh, it was shown that no algorithm uh, exists. Okay, so foundations. So I think a, a program for the foundations of deep learning and artificial intelligence uh, is, is needed. Okay, and this is all wrapped up in Hilbert's uh, 18th problem. Uh, so these types of results in, in, in this program uh, could include, for example, boundaries of methodologies. You, you prove that um, method X can or cannot solve problem Y, uh, but you also get uh, examples of universal or intrinsic boundaries. So we'll see uh, an example of that later on. And this is where you say that no algorithm uh, can solve a particular uh, problem. And I want to emphasize here that uh, there's, an ex uh, there's a key difference between uh, existence and construction when you consider these AI systems. So we're going to see a paradox uh, later on where there's a problem where you can prove that a good, stable and accurate neural network exists uh, to solve the problem, but you can never train uh, train that neural network or construct it from data. Okay, so um, also this program will need to involve two pillars of scientific computation, so that's stability. Okay, so we saw some examples of instability for AI systems uh, and also accuracy. So the goal of the rest of this talk, okay, is to uh, give you some results in this uh, direction for inverse problems. Okay, so here's the mathematical setup for the rest of this talk. I'm gonna consider a linear inverse problem. So I have some unknown X and what I see is uh, Y, which is equal to A of X, so A is a matrix, uh, plus some possible noise or perturbation. And I'm gonna consider the case of um, matrices that have fewer rows than columns. Okay, so it's a subsampled uh, image, for example. You might have in, in the back of your mind something like an MRI scan or something like that. Uh, so the outline for the rest of the talk will be, I'm first going to present a paradox. So that's uh, what I said on the previous slide, where you, there are examples of this where you can show uh, stable and accurate neural networks exist for the reconstruction, but you can never uh, train them. And then we're going to look at sufficient conditions that overcome this paradox. Okay, fast iterative restarted networks or finance. Uh, and then we're going to look at some numerical examples and some um, 
uh, evidence for a stability accuracy trade-off. Um, and then finally, um, we're going to sort of generalize the finite construction and consider something called approximate sharpness, uh, which is a, a, an idea from um, optimization. Okay, so the first question, um, can we train neural networks that solve the following three optimization problems? Okay, so th these, are, these are standard optimization problems that you will use to uh, regularize the, the universe problem on the previous slide. Uh, for example, if you expect the solution to be approximately sparse. So the first one is uh, this L1 uh, minimization subject to a measurement constraint. Uh, the second one is known as uh, lasso. And this third one known as uh, square root lasso. So it uh, doesn't have this square term here. So I'm gonna like psi equal the set of solutions, um, depending of course on which problem I'm considering. And then you might ask, why am I considering uh, these problems, well, is to avoid sort of um, bizarre uh, pathological mappings. Okay, so um, it's much easier to prove the existence of a stable and accurate neuro neural network for these uh, for these problems than it is for the original inverse problem. Uh, and these problems are well understood; they're well used. Okay, so these problems have a simpler solution map than this more general inverse problem here. Uh, so if you prove an impossibility result saying that you can't train in your network, it's perhaps uh, more surprising, at least it was to us. Uh, also, um, sort of turning it on its head, people are now starting to use deep learning to solve uh, optimization problems uh, like this as well. Okay, so keep those three problems in the back of your mind. The, the exact structure doesn't, doesn't really matter for what I'm going to say, but uh, there, there are three common optimization problems. Uh, the setup is as follows. Okay, so remember we're considering matrices A, complex matrices with fewer rows, M rows than uh, columns and columns. And I'm going to consider a um, collection of samples. Okay, so YK is equal to A of XK plus, uh, plus possible noise. So find a number of these. Uh, and in, but in practice, of course, you might not know uh, this modality or the samples uh, exactly, or you might not be able to store them to infinite precision. So what we actually have to do is consider rational approximations like floating point approximations. Uh, and I'm going to do that uh, with these uh, extra um, sub-indices n, which just tell me how accurate I'm approximating uh, the data. And I'm going to allow arbitrary precision. Okay, so the training set associated with the problem of trying to reconstruct the solution maps psi consists of a whole bunch of these uh, YKNs and ANs across this sample uh, for arbitrary N. Um, so if all of this is uh, too sort of uh, hard to pass on the first time through, in a nutshell, you can just think of, I'm allowing my algorithm arbitrary uh, precision training data. And in fact, the algorithm can be as greedy as it wants, right? Okay. And then the question is, given a collection um, omega, of such um, A modality and uh, samples S, does there exist a neural network that approximates the solution map and can it be trained? Okay, so let's think what could uh, go wrong with this, uh, with this goal. First of all, there might not be a neural network that approximates the solution map. Uh, it's relatively straightforward to get rid of that um, possibility. Uh, so you can prove via uh, variants of the universal approximations theorem that a stable and accurate neural network exists for the solution maps of these problems, at least for the classes of problems that I'm going to consider. So I'm always going to restrict myself to well-conditioned uh, problems here. Okay, so that doesn't happen. Uh, but it might be that there exists a neural network that approximates the solution map, but it cannot be trained. Uh, and the third, it might not be practical. So there might exist a neural network that approximates the solution map and an algorithm that uh, trains it, but the algorithm might need prohibitively many uh, samples or amount of training data to actually get a good uh, approximation of the solution map. So we will see both of these uh, two issues uh, in the following theorem. So here's the paradox. And I'm gonna go through this theorem um, a little bit slowly, uh, a little bit slower than the previous slides. So first of all, consider your problem uh, PJ. So remember those are the three optimization problems. And then let's pick any uh, dimensions, N and M. So remember, the, this is just the dimension of my matrix A. 
and then pick a positive integer k at least three and another positive, positive integer l. Then the theorem is as follows. There exists a well-conditioned class. So you can define condition numbers associated with these inverse problems. Okay, so I'm, I'm avoiding any sort of weird mathematical construct here by making sure everything is, is nice. So there's a well-conditioned class omega of elements A and S. Remember, A is the matrix. S are the samples, training samples, uh, such that the following holds. So omega is a class that depends on K and L and is fixed for the following three results. The first statement is that there does not exist any algorithm that given our training set produces a neural network so that the, um, the minimum accuracy over our, um, over our data of the reconstruction is bounded by 10 to the minus k. Okay, and even if you do this probabilistically, uh, you can't do it uh, with probability greater than a half. Okay, so you can think of this as saying, it's impossible to get k digits of accuracy despite the fact that a good, stable and accurate neural network exists. Second part, if you're slightly less greedy and you only require k minus one digits, uh, then it's possible, okay? So then you can bound the maximum error by 10 to the minus k minus one. However, there's a, there's a catch. Any such algorithm that trains your neural network for the reconstruction uh, and any uh, in positive integer m and probability p in this interval, there exists an adversarial training set so that the probability of um, either failing to get k minus one digits or of needing a training, um, uh, sorry, a size of training data, at least m is at least p. So this is saying that uh, there exists an algorithm for the reconstruction, for the training of the neural network, but it's impractical. Okay, because no matter how large this m, there always exists an adversarial training set that means you need at least uh, m um, sets of, um, points of data. Okay, and then at the same time, if you're less greedy again and only require k minus two digits, you can do this only requiring uh, l, so let's see out here, uh, training data. So in words, there are nice classes omega, where stable and accurate neural, neural networks exist okay, for the reconstruction. But if you want k digits, uh, no training algorithm can give you such a neural network. If you only want k minus one digits, there exists a training algorithm. But any such algorithm needs arbitrarily many training data. And then if you're less greedy again and go for k minus two digits, there exists a training algorithm uh, that uses only L training samples. Um, I always get asked this when I give this talk. Um, this is independent of the neural network architecture. Okay, so it's an example of uh, a universal uh, barrier. Uh, and sort of big picture, the way to think about this is that there's a difference between existence, okay, so the neural networks exist versus computational trainability. So this is telling you that proving universal approximation theorems that aren't constructive and giving you an algorithm that actually uh, trains the neural networks are not enough because there are some cases where there's a difference between existence and trainability. Okay, so theorems on existence in neural networks uh, sometimes have little to do with uh, the neural networks that are produced in practice. Okay, so that's all a bit abstract. Let's look at uh, an example, an explicit example of, of this in action. Uh, so here I've got a, um, a matrix A that um, comes from a subsample discrete cosine transform. Okay, and I'm going to consider um, a data set of 8,000 uh, six sparse uh, solutions. So here I have the, the different K. So this is the barrier that we can't beat. Here I have the precision N of the training data. And here I have the reconstruction error in fact, the minimum reconstruction, uh, reconstruction error uh, for different uh, neural, net neural networks. So these psi are uh, Lister. So this is um, learned iterative shrinkage thresholding. So this, this is a, uh, one of the first examples of something called an unrolled uh, neural network, which we'll see uh, later on. And also finites, which I'll talk about a bit later as well. So that's this column. Uh, so the key thing is, it, it doesn't really matter sort of comparing these two, that's not the key issue. 
the key issue that both of these numbers here are greater than this bound, okay? And we can't get past this bound in this, uh, in this rightmost column here. Okay, so that's an example of that uh, in practice. Um, again, this, this is a theorem that's not sort of you know, cooked up uh, just by mathematicians who care about such things. It also has uh, practical relevance. So I triple E spectrum actually run a, run a piece on, on, on this paradox um, a, a month ago. Uh, there's been some um, news uh, in AAAS, uh, which published Science and also uh, Sime News as well. So, uh, so for engineers, for scientists, and also for uh, numerical uh, analysts. So yeah, you can you can read sort of um, a condensed versions of of the theorem in, in, in those articles, for example. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the paradox. Um, and what this is telling us is that there's a, a Venn diagram that describes the, the world of neural networks. So you start off with um, looking at trainability. Okay, so a neural network exists. A neural network can be trained with one data, two data. It requires arbitrary large training data. So we don't want to live here, right? Because this is where uh, neural networks exist but can't be trained. And then on top of that, you've got the issue of um, what's the achievable level of accuracy? For example, can you get one digit, two digit? and so on, or arbitrary uh, accuracy. So a key question is, um, given your problem, where do we sit on this Venn diagram, right? Uh, and this Venn diagram will look very different whether we consider um, abstract existence or, or trainability. Okay, so we need a classification theory saying what can and can't be done. Um, so for example, uh, suppose we want to uh, minimize a convex function uh, one of the issues with um, with those um, optimization problems that I showed you before is that if you have um, suboptimality in the objective function, so epsilon suboptimality, uh, then this doesn't necessarily mean that your reconstruction is close to the set of minimizers. So the question is, can you find good input classes where you overcome uh, this issue? Okay, so where you're um, close to being optimal in the objective function, then that implies that you're close to the solution set. And we'll see the uh, answer to that question is yes. And curiously, actually, the, the relation, I won't go into this, but the, the relation between these two things here is directly related to the, uh, the K that you see in this theorem. Okay, so, so these, these class of elements are for a specific K and L. And you can switch the um, question on its head and say, if you give me a problem, what is the K and the L? Right, it's sort of the, the inverse way. And the way, uh, one of the ways to answer that is to look at this, um, this relationship here. Okay, so let's look at an example, a counterpart theorem, uh, where you can get past this paradox. Um, so I'm going to look at sparse regularization. So I have um, uh, something that is, is, is expanded in, uh, in wavelets, uh, for example. If you don't know what those are, don't worry so much. You can just think of it as, as, as a basis for my vectors. And I'm going to assume that my vector is um, sparse in level. So if I look at the wavelet levels of the system, then it's sparse uh, within these levels. Okay. And I'm going to call the collection of such sparse in level vectors sigma SM and define this distance function down here in terms of uh, the distance of X to uh, sparse in level vectors. Okay. Measured with this uh, weighted down one norm. Okay. I'm then going to use something called the robust null space property, which of, of course is you know, classical compressed sensing. Uh, and this says that if we have a matrix A, okay, then uh, there are constants rho and gamma, okay, if, if A satisfies the robust null space property, uh, so that if we take any SM support, support set, so that's a support set that obeys this sparse levels, then we have this inequality here. So this is saying that uh, the vector X Okay, the size on the support set is bounded by the size of the support set um, plus the size of A of X. So for example, if, if, e, sorry, if X is SM sparse, we can make this term vanish and we're bounding the size of X by the size of A of X. Okay, so it's something to do with the kernel of A, hence the name. Um, but why am I telling you this? Well, let's look at our objective function. So this is that square root lasso we saw earlier. Okay, so L1 regularization, square root lasso term. Assuming this, 
you can get an inequality that shows the distance between vectors in the L2 norm is bounded by something small plus the difference in the objective function of uh, this square root massive problem. Okay, so you're able to control uh, the distance by the suboptimality in the objective function. Uh, and that allows you to then uh, construct stable and accurate neural networks. So here's a simplified version of the theorem. So we provide an algorithm that does the following. So you, you feed it the sparsity parameters in the A uh, that satisfies the robust uh, null space property and levels uh, with the, these constants rho and gamma and some positive, uh, it's positive sorry, constants, uh, delta B1 and B2. It goes away, it then spits out a neural network phi n with order n hidden layers and width order, well, actually bounded by two times n. So that's the dimension of the vectors that you want to recover, m the dimension of y that you see, so that the following holds. For any uh, x and y, okay, with um, the distance of x to sparse and level vectors plus the noise of the measurements of order delta, and then some um, size constraints on x and y, you get the following stable and exponential convergence guarantee in the number of hidden layers, okay, down to this, uh, this term delta. So this delta is this factor here that controls, you can think of it as the noise of the measurements in your system. Uh, and actually, this delta is related to the, uh, the k in the previous theorem as well. Okay, so we call these fast iterative restarted networks or finites. Um, we call them that because they're, um, they're produced from a restart technique for primal dual algorithms. Um, more on that uh, in a few slides time. But I thought I'd give you a demonstration of the reconstruction. So here I have a, an image, okay, which I... Um, I take 15% um, subsampling and then corrupt with 2% Gaussian uh, random noise. So here's the image, here's a zoomed in section. Here is what happens when I do Fourier sampling, so a discrete Fourier transform to the A, uh, Walsh sampling, uh, so a Hadamard transform to the A. Here you can see the reconstruction uh, using these finites, right? It's pretty, pretty good for these applications. But let's actually look at that exponential convergence. Um, so here I have the number of hidden layers. Here's the relative error. So the red curves are the convergence of the objective function. Okay, so that's uh, the square and lasso. Uh, the blue curves are the reconstruction errors of the image. Uh, and you can think of this dash delta, uh, sorry, this dash line here is corresponding to that delta in the theorem. So you get this effect where you get uh, linear or exponential convergence until you hit this plateau uh, and then uh, it levels up. So this is for Fourier and also for uh, binary sampling. Okay, so um, let's now look at the stability properties of these neural networks, because you can actually prove that they're stable to adversarial attacks. So here's that automat network that I showed you uh, right at the beginning. So that's the paper uh, in Nature down here. Um, so you may have seen this, uh, this image before, but uh, what I've got is um, a bunch of images on the top. So the original image and then uh, an adversarial perturbation of increasing size. And in the bottom, I have the reconstruction of the neural network. And you can see that it's uh, severely stable, even for small uh, perturbations. So now I'm going to do the same uh, instability or stability test for finites, uh, where I'm ensuring that the perturbations that I compute are, of course, um, different and, and, and computed for finite itself, but are at least as large as the perturbations here in the L2 sense. So we prove stability in the L2 sense. Okay, so these are the results. Okay, so you, you try and uh, compute an adversarial perturbation of increasing size, but the network uh, remains stable as it should. So we, ha we have a theorem that actually proves this. Okay, curiously, you can also use uh, finites to stabilize unstable neural networks. So here I've taken automap and taken its output as an extra input to these finites, okay? And then I've run the same um, instability test for the concatenated uh, neural network. So you could imagine, for example, you know, this automat might be very accurate for uh, some images, uh, but it will be unstable um, near, near other images. Okay, so you want to keep the, the accuracy, but somehow get rid of the instability. Okay, so here we have the perturbation. Here's sort of um, 
with the image before you feed it into the refine it at the end and here's the uh, the reconstruction so you can see the um that you get this uh, stability even for adversarial attacks okay and then uh, I also wanted to show you this uh, experiment here as well um, again from the same from the same paper which I think is is interesting because it suggests that there's a stability accuracy trade-off in uh, many of these systems. So here I'm training neural networks to reconstruct um, pictures of ellipses from a discrete Fourier transform. So I think there's something like um, 4,000 ellipses or something in the training set. Um, here I have a Zundrian section, um, this red square here, where I'm applying the instability test or the stability test. So here we're looking for adversarial perturbations. This zoomed in section here, I've added uh, some text. Okay, and this will measure accuracy. Okay, so stability and accuracy. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is take a UNET. So this is a standard um, architecture for um, image, image analysis. And here I'm trailing the UNET on samples, okay, without noise. Okay, so clean samples of ellipses and, and the reconstruction. So here you can see severe instability, uh, but it's it's really accurate, right? So even though it hasn't seen ellipses in the training set, it can get, uh, sorry, seen text in the training set, it can get this text uh, pretty good. Okay, so we've got instability, but we've also got um, accuracy. Um, so what we did next was we trained this unit uh, with noise. Okay, and this is known as jittering, and it's a common way to, uh, to get stability. And now the picture completely changes. So now we have stability. Uh, but we've also lost a bit of accuracy, right? We can't read this text anymore. So now let's see what happens with uh, these finets. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, so we had unit without noise, unit with noise, finet. Uh, it's pretty stable. Not, of course, as stable as this one, but certainly more stable than this one. Uh, but it's also uh, very accurate, so you can see this, uh, see this text. So somehow we're sort of, you know, uh, balancing this trade-off. And, and of course, I'm not claiming that this is the end of the story, far from it. Uh, and in fact, the sort of the question that I'm going to end this talk on is how can we start to develop theorems that try and um, figure out that optimal trade-off between stability and accuracy? And what are the barriers of what you can and can't do? Okay, so just a little bit on, a, on the generalization of finites or the broader framework. Um, so for example, you might consider uh, the following um, optimization problem. So remember the setup, we're given uh, y equal to a of x, a is a matrix, plus some noise, and we want to recover x. And a common way we might do this is to minimize uh, this objective function here. Okay, so you have a, a regularizer of j, a convex function j, um, again, some L1 regularization term or analysis term, subject to a measurement constraint here. So here B is just a matrix that goes from N dimension of X to uh, CQ, okay? And I'm gonna assume, so this is replacing my robust null space property. I'm gonna assume an equality of the following form. I can bound the difference between vectors uh, by constant times the difference in the objective function. So this is the objective function plus the feasibility gap, so how close we are to realizing this constraint, plus an approximation term. Now, why am I doing this sort of with looking inequality? Well, this is known as approximate sharpness. So there's, there's a big literature in the optimization uh, camp that looks at um, what happens when you don't have these extra two terms, and this is known as sharpness. Okay, so you're bounding the distance between vectors by the uh, difference in objective function, and here we're adding on these extra terms to capture things like noise and approximate sharpness. And it turns out that you can prove that many uh, examples that we, uh, we all know and love, some of which are given here, uh, obey an inequality of this, this form. Okay, and once you've got this inequality, um, you can then go away and you can start to say, okay, there are algorithms that do the following. Uh, let F, um, delta be greater than zero, then we provide a neural network that um, trains an algorithm phi of depth uh, order log of one over delta. So think of delta as an error. So this is uh, only logarithmically growing in the, in the error of reconstruction. Uh, and width n plus m plus q, 
Okay, so that's the N here, the M here, the Q here, such that for all X, Y, so remember X is the thing we want to recover, Y is the thing we see, we have the following. If our measurements are bounded by epsilon, so the measurement error is bounded by epsilon, and this approximation term in the inequality is bounded by delta, then the reconstruction error of this neural network is bounded by uh, delta as well. Okay, so this error, uh, so, it's, so as you increase the depth, the number of hidden layers, this error will exponentially uh, decrease subject to this uh, condition here. Okay, so if you want further details on this uh, construction, you can see uh, this paper here. Um, it's just a brief idea of how this is, how this is done. Um, so I call the, the algorithm weighted accelerated restarted primal dual. So what we do is we first look at primal dual uh, iterations of this optimization problem. Okay, you have a certain um, bound on the uh, on this um, difference in objective function plus the feasibility gap. Okay, slow decay, one over kk is the number of iterations. You can then go back and use this approximate sharpness inequality to, uh, to use this to bound the distance. Okay, xk is the um, uh, reconstruction at the kth iteration by uh, this term here and then by this term here. And then you reweight and you optimize parameters and there's a trick which, is, which essentially allows you to uh, use k iterations to get a, um, a constant um, decrease uh, in, the, uh, in the size of this uh, g term here. Okay, and then you just restart. There's a um, telescopic sum argument. And in the end, what you get is a reconstruction of this form. Okay, so something a reconstruction of order delta plus something that decays exponentially in the number uh, of restarts. Okay, so and you can apply this this technique to lot, lots of different optimization problems. This is just one one example. Okay, so so what does this do in the end? Well, this gives you an optimization algorithm that you can enroll as a neural network. So this is a standard method of um, choosing network architectures. There's a, a brilliant um, a review article down here that you can read. Um, so you enroll your neural network and you can encode all of this stuff so that um, in the worst case scenario, you're guaranteed to have a reconstruction of this error. And you can also do things like in, enforce stability as well. But one thing I should say is that without the sort of restart technique, if you just naively apply this primal dual algorithm, uh, you only get slow um, one over P uh, convergence guarantees in the, um, in the enrolling. Okay, so there's stability with respect to the input. So that's you know, adversarial and st uh, stability, for example, but also the uh, numerical execution of uh, the networks themselves. For example, if you perturb the weight matrix or if you, know, you only apply the uh, neural network approximately. So everything's stable. Okay, uh, so here's just an example of a, a different optimization problem where you can use uh, these networks. So here I've taken uh, just a discrete Fourier transform, 15% uh, subsampling according to a particular subsampling strategy that's um, shown to be particularly good for uh, TV, that's total variation. And then I'm going to add some noise. Uh, and here I'm just showing the reconstruction with, uh, with different uh, choices of, if I just go back, sorry, to the regularization, different choices of the regularization function J here. Okay, and these are all um, neural networks that only have 25 layers. Okay, and you, you're getting uh, convergence to, to very, very good reconstruction. Okay, so this is TV. This is a method known as um, total generalized variation. And then you have this sort of um, total, total um, generalized variation plus an adaptive uh, weighted shearlet um, uh, frame here as well. Okay, so it's, it's quite general, and um, one of one of the things that I'm, I'm interested in doing is trying to take these tools and uh, apply them to different uh, different problems. Okay, so to uh, wrap up, so I wanted to leave enough question, uh, enough times for uh, some good questions. Um, there is a need for foundations in AI and deep learning. So this is Smale's 18th problem. Uh, what I gave you were nice inverse problems where stable and accurate neural networks exist, uh, but they can never be trained. And the existence of a training algorithm depends on the desired accuracy. 
Okay, so for any um, positive integer k, at least three, there are classes where algorithms may compute neural networks to k minus one digits, but not k. Achieving k minus one digits requires arbitrary many training data. Achieving k minus two digits requires only one training data. Under specific uh, conditions, for example, that robust null space property, I showed you that there are algorithms that can train stable and accurate neural networks. So we looked at finites. Okay, so these achieve uh, exponential convergence in the number of hidden layers, and we also have a proof that they withstand uh, adversarial attacks. And then I showed you evidence um, without any theorems uh, for a trade-off between stability uh, and accuracy in deep learning. And then there was a more general algorithm warped, which uh, unrolled primal dual iterations, okay, under an approximate sharpness condition. Um, and this, uh, if, if you do this, you actually get as a special case uh, finance. So a question that I want to end on is sort of, you know, how do we develop the tools to look at this uh, trade-off between uh, stability and accuracy? Okay, and I, I, it's really important there to um, look at them in the context of trainability as opposed to what's actually feasible uh, in terms of abstract existence. Okay, so you have this difference here between existence and uh, trainability. So yeah, uh, that's what I wanted to end on. Uh, thank you uh, very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Matt. That's a very nice talk. So I'll just stop the recording. <laughs>